Well, good afternoon to you. Uh, today we are again studying uh, this incredible piece of scripture that we're looking at, which is 1 Peter. This is the first of Peter's epistles, which means letters. Uh, we're in chapter 2. Now, over the last a few months actually, because we took a pause, didn't we, over the Christmas period. We've been working our way through this. And uh, if you were with us last week, uh, we bumped backwards and in, into Psalm 34 and actually just had a look at, uh, essentially, that uh, section of scripture which is clearly on Peter's heart because as he's beginning to talk to us today, he's talking to us uh, essentially from that. So it's worth just kind of having a, a kind of a flick back through that uh, at some point, if you'd like. Peter's also tying a lot of his ideas today into the previous chapter. Um, and again, this just kind of shows his writing style. Quite different to John's. So we've talked in the past that uh, John has a tendency to speak himself around in circles. And that is actually a particular Greek style of writing. To keep going round, dropping something in, and then it sounds like he's just wandered off on something else and come back. Peter, on the other hand, actually builds a foundation and then he begins to, once he's got that down, begins to then work on building it up and kind of coming back. Very similar to the way that Paul writes. So um, today I just want to encourage you to grab a cup or a mug of whatever your favourite drink is. Today it is absolutely pouring down with rain and I think there's nothing nicer than essentially sitting down whilst it's raining, snuggling up uh, and reading a good book uh, with your favourite beverage. I'm drinking green tea so you'll see me throughout this uh, time period that we're on uh, just enjoying a nice drink and uh, I encourage you to do likewise with me. At the beginning of each of our sessions, one of the things that we uh, do is we take a moment just to invite God into this. You see, much like anything that we do, if we make it about the sole purpose of doing this to better our knowledge, we miss the point. Uh, it's much like, uh, do we fast for the sake of losing weight? Do we give to church so that we can pat ourselves on the back and say uh, we're helping the ministry grow? Or do we do these things because actually we love God and we want to know him more, we want to experience him more, and we want others to experience him? That's what it comes back to. So as we uh, take just a, a bit of time now just to uh, reflect on this scripture, let's start by just inviting God to meet us. Now, uh, at Four Oaks, we've gotten into this habit now of just taking a, a moment to pause, to reflect, to invite God into this moment and just to be fully present. And to do this, we just put out our hands, we create silence, and then I will open in prayer. Now in this silence, I just want you to invite God by the power of his Holy Spirit in the way that only he can do is to come and meet you here, to fill you afresh in this moment, that this would not just be an exercise of learning more, but that this would be an exercise in knowing him more. So let's do this together. Heavenly Father, living God, we invite you into this moment, right here, right now, to speak to us through these words that we read. Speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. Increase our level of joy, increase our level of knowledge of you, increase our experience of you. In this moment, Heavenly Father, we ask, in Jesus' name, Amen. So, today we are reading uh, from chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 4 through to the end of verse 12. So not a massive chunk, but still slightly more than what we looked at last week. If you were with us last week, we only looked at the first three verses. Today we're looking at a bit more, um, and uh, we're gonna take a little bit of time just to kind of reflect on that. So my hope and my prayer for you is that as we do this in this moment right here and right now, that this will be a moment of 
just clarity between you and God that this might just through the scriptures just speak to you um, and again I'm going to explain a lot of what's going on I'm going to expand on it a little bit but most of this is stuff that you can kind of understand uh, through just the reading of it and also uh, when you're looking at it within the uh, what we call the meta narrative which is the essential the narrative that goes across the whole of scripture and you begin to look at it through that sort of lens again it starts to make a lot more sense and also with the addition of any form of a study guide whether that's a study bible uh, or whether that's a book written about the particular section of scripture that you're looking at so there's loads of different ways to be able to learn to be able to go further and i want to encourage you to use things that assist you right? that's what you're doing right now i'm assisting you so it's the same principle so Let's uh, let's jump straight in. I'm uh, reading this from the New Living Translation, as always, just because of its accessibility and its inclusive language. Uh, but read along with whatever translation that you have to hand that is your chosen source of study. Verse 4. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people but he was chosen by God for great honour. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What is more, you are his holy priests. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honour. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust in him recognise the honour God has given him. But those who reject him. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents and foreigners, to keep away from worldly desires that war wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among the unbelieving neighbours. Then, if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honourable behaviour and they will give honour to God when he judges the world. Okay, so quite a bit in that. Most of it, if we're honest, they just make sense. Um, and again, this is just a passage that we're going to just take a look at. I'm going to work through it verse by verse. And actually just in an attempt to try and just kind of draw our hearts towards what Peter is trying to get at. So that we might be able to experience God more. So, uh Again, this starts off with, you are coming to Christ. In other translations, it reads, when you come to Christ. This kind of sense that there's, it's expected that you come to Christ. And let's face it, you're doing a Bible study with me now because you're trying to get to grips with your scriptures more. But I'm still surprised by how many believers who come to church, but or even 
people who say that they're Christians but make no effort whatsoever. So some who choose not to come to church, who choose not to interact with God on uh, any sort of a level. And to me, that just it doesn't make sense. Uh, the fact that what, what we're doing today is essentially trying to kind of come to grips with and come to terms with who God is. This is the pursuit of a relationship. And let's face it, being a Christian is more than just a title. It is a doing it's 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 a verb it's kind of like i'm i'm i am a christian because i pursue god and so it's this when you are coming so again with ours in the new living translation it says you are coming to christ who is the living cornerstone so over this next uh, few sections of scripture uh, Peter keeps using this terminology so we get that's uh, an idea of something that's building so we get the cornerstone, we get living stones, we get the temple of God. So on the one side, he's talking about like almost like a physical building. And then on the other side, he then starts to use terminologies like we're priests. Well, now to, to you and me, the idea of being a church building sounds a little bit mundane. I mean, don't get me wrong, if it's a beautiful, glorious cathedral, you know, I grew up on the outskirts of uh, York uh, as a kid and York Minster. Now, if you're telling me that I'm a, a living stone in that cathedral, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Litchfield Cathedral, again, rather beautiful. Four Rocks Baptist Church. I don't know, maybe you've joined us on this digital journey and actually have yet to see our building. I mean, it's it's a nice building, but it's not something I'm overly proud of. But we missed the point. Because we don't quite understand the necessity for the temple, which is at the absolute centre point of a Jewish believer. Uh, so we're going to take a little bit of a look at that as we go through. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at this other terminology, which is this idea of being a priest, which is the, the role of an individual within the temple. Uh, and so we're going to be looking just at a little bit of that as we kind of work our way through. And then we can kind of understand at what Peter is actually getting at. And then again, Peter comes back to, and we're going to look at this in a brief moment, uh, this idea of living as temporary residents within an area. This goes back to what we looked at within the first chapter. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's pull this apart and have a little bit of a look. So... First of all, we've got this idea that we're coming to God who is living. Now, it's, it's great because we're coming to, to Christ who we know has died. Uh, but again, it's common knowledge to us as believers that Jesus died but then rose again. So he's not the dead stone, but he's the living stone. It's obvious, but it just needs to point to be out. He was clearly rejected by people. That's why the, the leading uh, religious leaders at the time had him crucified. He was rejected. Yet the purpose of him coming was to create something new and wonderful from Israel. And we're going to come to that in a little bit of a moment. And again, we've got to kind of understand that uh, to us, the Christian faith is something that we've seen in and out of our churches and we're aware of. But this dates way back beyond us and there's something wonderful and an incredible heritage and I think that's why this needs to be pulled apart a little bit but we've got this idea that they rejected Jesus there was a select few who chose to believe and from that select few we saw the most incredible movement which still is rumbling on today 2000 years later and uh, we know that because that's what we're doing right now so uh, this idea that Jesus did this is then we are now living stones. So verse five, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What is more, you are holy priests. So let's just press pause before we go any further. And let's just kind of take a look at why this is such a big deal to Peter. Uh, and we will miss it because what we are non-Jewish people. The terminology given to that by Jewish people is that we are Gentiles. It's not a derogative term, it literally just means those who are not Jewish. And so let's just take a moment just to look at what the Jewish temple and that system is all about. And now if you know all of this, uh, don't worry, sit back uh, and enjoy your mug of whatever it is that you're drinking. Uh, but maybe some of this might just kind of jog your memory a little bit. 
So first of all, um, as, as the Jewish people are brought out of Egypt and who are then established as a nation, God makes this wonderful promise with them. And that promise is that he will be their God. So not just the God of the nations, but he will be specifically their God. He enters into an incredible relationship with them. And the, the terminology that's ver that he uses when he talks about his people is very much a husband and wife. It's like we're going to get married, like this kind of like sense of like uh, that there's an exclusivity, uh, an ability for them as a nation to be able to come to God and for God to listen. And, and so that there's kind of like this wonderful intimacy that goes on uh, and that we would be in the, sorry, the, the people of Israel would be his people. And so you've got this kind of like that God promises to do some aspects and the people of Israel promise to do others. And in this wonderful um, kind of connection is is where they will be at. Now, at the center of this, um, God creates this and has Moses create this uh, this kind of like a, a tabernacle, which is like a tent, which uh, like the presence of God uh, was kind of most intense within most intense. <laughs> Anyway, um, and, and so you've kind of got this idea of like just uh, this, as, as this nomadic people walked through the wilderness with this end goal of eventually ending up in uh, a place that would later be called Israel uh, and that, that God would be in their midst going before them um, through the through the wilderness um, in the we see during the daytime uh, by a cloud and, and by night by a pillar of fire. We've got this kind of like just sense of like God just really being in their midst. When they finally get to Israel, uh, a few centuries later, uh, David builds a temple. So this is no longer just a tent, but this is a uh, an actual physical building. And he does this and dedicates it to God. Uh, and God says, you know, that he is the owner of the whole earth, that he doesn't need a temple. But yet he chooses to make it his dwelling place on earth. So there's something really special about that, that God, the living God, the creator of the universe, would kind of make his presence more intense uh, within this temple. Um, and that you'd have uh, the people of Israel would come to this temple to meet with God and to be to be part of his people to ask for forgiveness of the things that they've done wrong to kind of just interact with uh, god in a really special way and, and all of those uh, aspects of uh, the offerings that they would bring and that there was a select group of people called levites who were chosen to be the people who you know every other kind of tribe got uh, a patch of land that was theirs but the Levites they didn't get that what the Levites got was actually something even more special was that they would be the people who would do the interacting between the wider people of Israel and God so they almost lived in and around the temple and were constantly in uh, active duty in uh, active relationship with the living God so when we begin to look at this idea that, you know, God is saying, you know, Peter is saying here, as, as, uh, as described, is that we become living stones in that temple. That there's, that the temple is where God resides. And so that we, the people, you know, we often kind of make this as an individual. I, Philip Wilkes, it's all about me. It's all about me being a living temple. Well, there's an aspect of that that's true, but actually it's within wider community. We, the church, you and I, a building, the church building is just a building. I mean, it's, it's only when we begin to worship in there and we meet together, when we come together, we are the church. And so this is something quite special. Now, this is written... This is why we talk about this book being just so incredible is because, well, this was written before the temple was pulled down for the second time. This was uh, done probably about 20, 30 years after this, uh, this, this particular letter was written. So and then as that happened, the, the, the Roman Empire had such an issue with the way that the, the Jewish people kept revolting against them, that they just destroyed the temple and then scattered the people of Israel all over the place. Because got sometimes nicknamed the Great Dispersion, 
Now that happens after Peter writes this letter. So as Peter is actually kind of talking about like the idea of us being a temple, well, it suddenly becomes so much more poignant to the people of Israel in the years to come as they look at this letter and say, wow, this is written for us now. We don't have a temple. We can't go and worship in the temple anymore. But actually, hold on a second. Peter is saying ahead of his time that this is written saying that we are the stones. We are the, the, the living stones of a living temple to which God would reside in. This is why this becomes really incredible. And not just that, but we are also his priests. We are the Levites. We are those who are working and in, in, in living in communion with the living God. So this is not just that we come together and we are the temple, but we're actually also living in that temple and we are working with God in that temple, which is why, again, this book is extra special. Now then, something else that we miss out on in this as well is as it goes through this and actually talks about, you know, just how great this is. We then get to verse nine uh, and he says, but you are not like that. Now he's talking to a group of people who are both Jewish and non-Jewish. So this letter is not written to the new Jewish people, but this is written uh, essentially about us in the here and now. Um, uh, and, and so he says this, he says, but you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Now, this was a promise that was speaking, spoken, beg your pardon, over the Jewish people. As they came out of Egypt, this is the covenant, which means promise, that God made with the people of Israel. Now, Peter is using this in a much wider sense and he's saying that about non-Jewish people as well you and me and he's saying to these non-Jewish people that we because we believe in God and we've been welcomed into his family that now we are like royal priests which are a select few within a wider chosen nation a select few who are chosen even more to then become those who work and live in the temple who have got an ultra special relationship now get this he's saying that to these these non-jewish people that that now we are the chosen people that's not to say that he's doing away with the others because god doesn't break his promises but what he's saying is that just as christ came he didn't come to set up a new religion called christianity and do away with the old he came for it to be the fulfillment of all that is great and that was part of the, the Jewish traditions and to kind of do away with all of the rubbish stuff that actually is, is, is binding the Jewish people and release them into a new relationship. So you fast forward 2000 years later and that's where we are. Although I think we've probably added our own series of uh, stumbling blocks to it as well. I think that's probably one of the things that we are uh, quite culprits of. But nevertheless, this is what's being said. So I, I love this. And then it goes back again to this idea of being temporary residents. Come on up here then. Come up here. Come on. Up. So this idea that uh, we're temporary residents. So let's have a little bit of a look at this. Oh, it looks like Malachi is going to try and read it. So uh, he then goes on and says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against you. Now, this is a terminology he's going to be using a little bit as we come together, uh, look through this, this idea of a war being waged. Uh, but there's this kind of like sense that he's saying, that you are a temporary resident. This ties back in with the very beginning when it's saying that although you are believers, actually we live as though we don't belong. Because well, when we become Christians, you know, I always used to say this to young people as they would say that they want to become a Christian. I'm like, are you sure? I'd almost try and like talk them out of it. I'm like, because actually when you go to a party, it doesn't feel the same. As a believer, like it's not the same. When we are in, in the office and people are telling crude jokes, it's not the same. When we're seeing the, 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 the norms of our culture, because we're now believers and we're called to live holy, these things begin to grit against us. We're 
not of this world. So what Peter's kind of saying is that actually that's a good thing that we recognize that we're not. And so as we live with him, we kind of work towards this beautiful thing. We work in a way that brings honor to God in everything that we do so that even non-believers who may not like the way that we do things will still see that we are honorable in the way that we're going about doing this. I think there's just such a, a real poignant finger on us is that actually we are in in everything that we do like we're witnesses to god and that's why non-christians would love nothing better than to be able to point at us and say look but you're hypocrites or that you that you do this or that actually there's no real strength in what you're saying x y and z non-believers want that to be a reality because if they make that a reality then they don't have to be challenged by the truth that we are living. This is why it's extra caution for us to try and live a life that brings witness to him. So that kind of brings us to the end of this section that we're looking at. Uh, And I just want to encourage you that through this, that the points that we're essentially trying to take out of this is that you, you might not feel like it, But from the moment that you invited Jesus to come and to be your saviour, and now we talk about the Lord and saviour, and if you were with us throughout any of the sermon series of last year, that was just a repetitive theme, that we admit that Jesus, we say, actually, we can't do this on our own. Lord, would you become my Lord, which means that I submit to him, and my saviour, which means that actually he saves me because I know that I can't do this on my own. When we make that statement, God comes and dwells, in us just like the temple of the old testament that god dwells in us so you need to know that today that no matter what this week's got in store for you god's within you dwelling within you and that he has chosen you to be in close-knit fellowship you are now a priest and that your role sorry and that your role is to be that in communion with him so my hope and my prayer for you this week is that this would become an actual reality in your life and remember you're not on your own